Shalom, everyone. And the Nazarim, that's what we're called. There's something for the masses to see, and then there's something for the initiated to see. It's the darkness hiding in open view. We call them Wiccans, witches, warlocks, wizards, shamans. That's what they go by. It's poison doctrine. Anyway, welcome to our seminar. It's uh, roughly about an hour. My name is Lou White, and um, for those of you that are not familiar with some of these terms, I want to be sensitive to you. It's not only for those of us that have been doing this for decades or years, but uh, it's for everybody, you know. And if there's ever a question, I, I'm going to try to, you know, answer questions, or if I can, if you have a question, and we'll stop and look at it. Just shoot your hand up or, uh, you know, if you've brought your little bike horn with you, just let that blast and we'll uh, see. I forgot mine today, but uh, anyway, I had it last month. If some of you were here, remembered that. But anyway, this uh, terminology is important because this is part of a restoration. This is one of the pieces of the restoration puzzle. And uh, Zephaniah, one of the prophets of, of Yisrael, had said in chapter 3, I think verse 9, that Yahuwah would restore to his people a pure lip. In other words, they would start speaking the right words and the right language again because he, he was going to have to speak to this people with babbling lips and at one time and he's going to restore that pure lip. And these are the terms. Uh, instead of using the word Lord, we're going to use the word Yahuwah because that's his name. I mean, how could his name possibly be L-O-R-D? Well, they took it out. And that is a violation of the third commandment. And J-E-S-U-S -S is a recent phenomenon. There's no letter J. It was a Y. Of course, it operated as a Y, too. But anyway, the, the real name we're going to use is Yahusha or Yahushua, which means Yah is our deliverer or south, our savior. Now, Christos is a, is a Greek term, so we're not needing any Greek. We're just going to go straight to the Hebrew and bring it right over. Mashiach is the word for, you know, the anointed one. And G-O-D, G-O-D, if you look that up in an encyclopedia, it'll tell you that this was formerly a proper term, a proper name, applicable to, to heathen deities of, of the Teutonic tribes. And when it was adopted or brought in when Christianity was adopted by these heathens. So it's a heathen term, and we're just, and it's a proper name of a solar deity, the sun. And the Yahudim is one of the tribes of Israel, the royal tribe, by the way, that kings come from, and it means Yah, uh, worshipers of Yah or praisers of Yah. Uh, it's one of Leah's children, the fourth son, and she said, this time I shall praise Yah. So they named the boy Yehuda. And all the kings come from that tribe. And today they call them Jews, but that's just today. Christians, uh, that's another faith, actually. The original followers were called Nazarim. If you look at Acts 24, verse 5, and look at the prophecy in Yirmiyahu or Jeremiah 31, verse 6. Israel is another term for all the tribes, whether they're scattered or not. Uh, but they are scattered all over the earth. You know, that's the whole point. Uh, they aren't just this one tribe. They're all the tribes that don't really know who they are. So they are like the prodigal son in the parable. You know, that we're coming to our senses and we're returning back to the covenant. I just wanted to cover that with you. And you can, uh, if you're watching this on a DVD, you can slow this down and, you know, look at every word on the chart. Now, Nazarim are guardians of the name of the creator and his Torah, which the word Torah means instruction. And that's a picture of his name in Babylonian Hebrew, or what they call Aramaic, it's a square script, yod He ua He, And this is the original, that's the, uh, the most ancient one in the scrolls. And of course, sometimes you see that in pictogram form too. 
But uh, this, this is, I haven't ever seen any pictogram scrolls, but these are the ones that are found all over the Middle East. Uh, from Luke 11, we learn that we're to pray in a certain pattern, after a certain pattern, and we'll do that right now. If you read Luke 11, you'll see this emerging, something about his name and his will, which is his instructions, his Torah. Our Abba, who is in Shamayim, Kodesh be your name. Your kingdom come, and then your will be done on Eretz, as it is in Shamayim. Give us this day, or our, this Yom, our daily Lekem, which is the word for bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive those who are indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the honor forever. Amen. Some people use extra letters in the name, Yahuwah, and that's okay, but I'm, I'm, the problem that I have with just jumping in and doing that without thinking is this. Let's say Yahuwah waits another hundred or two or three hundred more years before he returns, and here we are writing down all this material using extra letters. <clears throat> and we know that these letters have undergone changes just in the, in the recent several hundred years. So if they write it Y-A-H-U-W-A-H, then we spell it with just the U lacking the W because see the letter W is actually a, new, a fairly new letter. It came into common use around the 13th century. And that was also the same time that John Wycliffe was doing his first translation into English. And it is the letter W. It's derived from the same letter in Hebrew that we call the sixth letter of the alphabet, Ua, commonly known as Wa. And that's because of the distortion too. That when we say Wa, we're really not pronouncing the letter I itself correctly. And I didn't know that you know, 20 years ago, but a after research, I found that the letters V and W actually come from the letter Ua, you know. And uh, <clears throat> the reason that we do it is to keep it simple because see, there was a fellow named Occam. He was a Franciscan friar. And uh, he was living in a town called Occam in, uh, in, in England, of course. And in the 13th century, there it is. Uh, the reason that Occam's theory is known as the razor is that he cuts away unnecessary entities. And it's hard to justify why a simpler explanation is preferable to a complex one. So if you get real complex and you start explaining things with complexity, it gets really, it's not simple, you know, and so you're, you've left the, the path. And it encourages people to cut out this unnecessary complexity. So all you really need is the letter U to get the job done. If you pronounce this Yahuwah with the W and pronounce it without the W, it sounds exactly the same. So all we're saying is let's simplify that, uh, if possible. And let's try to get together on it, but anyway. Now, uh, I'm gonna show you this keyboard. Some of you are musicians and musically inclined and you're gonna understand the subject that we're gonna cover today because this stuff is gonna be foundational. It's actually uh, like a heartbeat. In music, there's really only seven natural notes and you can see all the letters here. That's a little confusing because you see the letter A and you think that's the beginning point. It's really not. The letters are just na random names for the notes. They're actually intervals of sound. You know, they go up in a certain orderly way. It starts with A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and that's seven letters. And then it starts over again with an eighth letter Really, it's not an eighth letter. It's really just the, the first letter starting again. So it's like the week, the first day of the week, the second day of the week, and on and so forth to the seventh day. And then it starts over with the first day again. See, it's like that. That's when I'm going to correlate. And sometimes people call this an octave. Octave means eight, the eighth note. Octave is not really an eighth note, though. It's a repeat of the first note. So the first day of the week is like the eighth day from the first day, you know. And we're going to look at creation week, too. Creation week is our pattern, you know. And it's a repeating pattern, and we see it on our keyboards. 
and we see it in the spectrum, you know, the colors. Anyway, does the word of Yahuwah, this is just a question, does it contradict your religion? Now, that's an interesting question because it probably does in most every, everyone's case. Uh, Yahuwah is the one that defined what a day is. He defined it. We didn't. And he had defined what a week was and what a month is and what a year is. And he gave us his appointed times. But Christianity, which is a religion, uh, started in Alexandria, Egypt. It didn't start where people think. But anyway, that um, moved to Rome because Rome and Alexandria were very closely tied together. And they were very highly influenced by Greek ideas and language. But uh, Christianity abandoned the festivals of Yahuwah and did so uh, in, in order to have nothing to do with any of them. Now, here's the retelling of the covenant for the scattered tribes of Israel in the last days, and it's given at Deuteronomy 5, and this is what we're trying to restore primarily. Number one is, I am Yahuwah your Elohim who brought you out of the land of Mitzrayim, out of the house of bondage. You have no other mighty ones against my face or before my face. In other words, let's look at that first commandment just for a moment. If you put another deity's name or face in front of Yahuwah's face, but operate everything as if it's Yahuwah, but it's some other deity, like the dragon, and you artificially have been deceived, perhaps, and most likely just deceived, then you've put something in front of his face. It's before his face. It's against his face. And you're not really seeing the true Yahuwah and because you're being diverted away from the truth and someone else is wanting to be like Yahuwah, so he imitates him and steals his position in your mind. And yet you think you're really serving the true creator. And the way, one of the ways that that's done is by changing the path that you walk in just slightly, but keeping most of it. Or taking his name out and putting some other device in there, you know, some other name. Number two is you do not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of which is in the heavens above or which is in the earth beneath or which is in the waters under the earth. You do not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, Yahuwah, your Elohim, am a jealous El, visiting the crookedness of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing kindness to thousands, to those who love me and guard my commands. Number three is you do not cast the name of Yahuwah, your Elohim, to ruin, for Yahuwah does not leave him unpunished who casts his name to ruin. Now that's a different translation than you normally see, but it's very basic. The uh, word cast means to throw or to lift up. And the, that's the Hebrew word uh, nasa, like the, the, you know, the organization called NASA. It's like that, only it's not, you know, they lift a lot of things up too. And the word ruin is the word shoah, which means to utterly lay waste. Number four is guard the, sh the Sabbath day to set it apart as Yahuwah your Elohim commanded you. So that's a reference to the week. He had to retrain Israel and he's retraining us too. Six days you labor and shall do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath of Yahuwah your Elohim. You do not do any work, you nor your son nor your daughter, nor your male servant nor your female servant, nor your ox nor your donkey nor any of your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates, so that your male servant and your female servant rest as you do. And you shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Mitzrayim, and that Yahuwah your Elohim brought you out from there by a strong hand and by an outstretched arm. Therefore, Yahuwah your Elohim commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. So you see, Yahuwah your, your Elohim is very uh, closely tied to this particular commandment. He mentions his, his name and his relationship to us as our Elohim quite often. And that's a covenant sign, by the way, if you look at Yehezkel or Ezekiel chapter, chapter 20. Number five, 
Respect your father and your mother as Yahuwah, your Elohim, has commanded you so that your days are prolonged and so that it is well with you on the soil which Yahuwah, your Elohim, is giving you. Number six, you do not murder. Number seven, you do not break wedlock. Number eight, you do not steal. Number nine, you do not bear false witness against your neighbor. And number 10, which the Catholics, I'm sorry to say, uh, some of us came from that, divided into two commandments in order to wipe out the second commandment, bowing to idols. Number 10 is you do not covet your neighbor's wife, nor do you desire your neighbor's house, his field, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, his ox, nor his donkey, or whatever belongs to your neighbor. And this is a continuation right into the next chapter in Deuteronomy or Debarim. Hear, O Yisrael, Yahuwah our Elohim, Yahuwah is one. And you shall love Yahuwah your Elohim with all your heart and with all your being and with all your might. And these words, which I am commanding you to obey, shall be in your heart. And you shall impress them upon your children and shall speak of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up, and, when, and you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. And you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Now that's a commandment. You know, we should do this. And uh, it's interesting that this is overlooked, you know, and uh, some, some other things are done instead. But in order for us to remember the commandments, that's why we read them every week. And I know that some of you are getting fatigued over it, but I can't get over reading them. I, even when I'm driving, I just go over the commandments, you know. Obsessed, I guess, is the word. Now, this is a discussion today that we're going to focus on. And it's literally a heartbeat. And it starts with the beginning of creation. And we're, we know it as the week. The word in Hebrew is Shabua, which is from, root, from the root Sheba, which means seven. Sheba, like the queen of Sheba, means the queen of seven. Well, you know, Sheba is the root, and Shabua is derived from that because it means seven. Now, the 7,000-year plan is, uh, is embedded in, in, in this. Some people say that the first week was each 1,000 a a thousand years. You know, like day one was a, took Yahuwah a thousand years. And that's not the way that I believe or teach. But there is a, a, a thousand year pattern that is being established for redemption purposes. Now, we're going to look real quick one more time at this keyboard and we're going to understand these are natural notes. These are not things that are like, these were discoveries really, because they're harmonious. And harmonies were discovered very early. No one really knows who did this, but uh, the king of Israel was a, an accomplished musician with a harp. And of course, uh, his lute or harp must have had about uh, 10 strings on it, but uh, in order to, you know, somewhere in the midst of this scale, these natural notes appeared on his harp, no doubt, so that he could play two notes or three notes at a time with his fingers, and it would make chords and there were harmonies. If you had the strings out of tune, then it wouldn't sound right. Now, uh, there's those letters again, and like to, I wanted you to see them because there's only seven letters, and the repeat is the octave. That means eight, and that's the same thing that goes on with our week. There's like a time wave of seven days. Genesis 2 is what we want to look at, starting with verse 1. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed, and all their array. And on the seventh day... Elohim completed his work which he had done and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done and Elohim blessed the seventh day and set it apart because on it he rested from all his work which Elohim in creating had made. These are the births of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that Yahuwah Elohim made earth and heavens. Now the millennial days are like a thousand years each. There's a, a millennium means it's just a Latin word for a thousand. So a thousand years is like one day in the prophetic calendar. <clears throat> and the countdown to the marriage of the lamb is involved in that. The marriage of the lamb is something that people think about. Who's the wife? That's what we're going to have to find out too. Do you want to be the wife? If you're not his wife, 
it might not bode well for you. So we want to become his wife. His wife in scripture is identified as being Yishrael. You know, that's, his na- that's the name that scripture calls his wife. If you read Revelation 19, verse 9, and Revelation 20, verse 4, some things will emerge. Now, 2 Peter alludes to this same thing. 2 Peter chapter 2, but there also came to be false prophets among the people, as also among you there shall be false teachers, who shall secretly bring in destructive heresies, that would, those would be destructive to the point where people would lose their salvation, and deny the master who bought them, and some people are lo- leaving a belief in Messiah and going over to rabbinical Judaism. Many of you know that. Bringing swift destruction on themselves. And many shall follow their destructive ways, because of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. That's the way of truth would be the Torah. The Ten Commandments are considered to be legalistic. And so they're teaching you not to obey them. And many shall follow the destructive way because because of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And in greed, with fabricated words, they shall use you for gain. They'll quote Malachi chapter 3, and they'll say, don't you see this? You've got to tithe. Excuse me. But yet you won't have to keep the Sabbath day, the day that he blessed. Well, from of old, their judgment does not linger, and their destruction does not slumber. So if we adopt pagan symbols and pagan festivals and pagan costumes, which is what a lot of people see in some of the higher places of the earth, uh, religious men stand up in costumes that were formerly pagan. They invent things like sacraments. There's no sacraments. And veneration of images, holy water, Sunday Sabbath, and infant baptisms. They're all human traditions. They have a beginning point, and men invented them. They're not coming from Scripture. See, we have two kinds of ways of interpreting Scripture. We can, we can interpret what the Word says and learn from that, that's direct, without bringing anything in, in our head. And that's called exegesis in the scholarly community. And if you bring things with you that you already believe to the study, and you read into the text what you think is it's saying from based on what you already believe, that's eisegesis. And they also have been inventing new things lately called crescent sightings and uh, lunar sabbaths. Lunar sabbaths. You know, 20 years ago, that word, th- those two words weren't even put together. No one had ever heard of such a thing. Now, that's something that some of you may not be familiar with, but we're going to touch and go on that a little bit to to try to straighten that out and hopefully keep people from from falling for that. But uh, the moon is not setting Sabbaths, and yet, except for the the high Sabbaths or the great Sabbaths, which are the annual Sabbaths that happen, you know, according to the moon. And they're given separately at Leviticus 23. You know, the first commandment, I mean, at at Leviticus 23, it starts out saying that the, the Sabbath of the week, which is the heartbeat of creation, the seventh day, is always a day of rest. And then it starts out again and it says, and now in the first month, on the such and such day of the month, you're to do this. Well, and so it starts over again and it says, now based upon the moon, this is the process. But the moon does not have anything to do with the week. Now, how we relate to time as a foundational reference point, time. We organize our lives by determining the most important aspect of time, and that is the current day that we're, li- that we're living in. If you wake up in the morning and you don't give any thought to what day of the week it is, then your whole life schedule could be off com- compared to the rest of the society as well as the earth. The whole world is on the same pattern. And it wasn't the uh, Romans that did it to you, as some of the lunar sabbathers will tell you. They say those Romans changed it. And yet all these aboriginal tribes in these unknown places that have just been discovered, they have a seven-day week, you know. Now, the Romans did attempt to change the week to eight days. They did not invent the concept of a week. They just tried to change the one that was already there. They did not alter the week to accommodate the Christians. 
but rather their change faded away in the face of the whole world's formerly established pattern of the week. The week of seven days goes far back into prehistory, and like it or not, the week is an echo of creation. The, in fact, the seven-day week is the heartbeat of creation. It's a marker that stands as evidence for all people in all of time that Yahuwah is the creator. And if you leave the Sabbath day, then, you know, the, the seventh day is no longer the seventh day, then you're not honoring him as the creator. That's what it was done for. Now, here's that keyboard again. Like musicians playing a song together, each of us have to have an understanding of the week too. We must follow the same pattern together. Now, musicians can easily see the pattern of repeating sevens every time they sing or play together with others in the same key. The, the word octave means eight, but this is an interval, and it's simply the first interval of the, be, of the beginning interval over again. So you see this is a very easily seen thing. This letter right here seems to be the beginning point because it's the, natural, the beginning of the natural notes. The natural scale is actually the C scale. Musicians know this. It doesn't start with the letter A. First, the first interval, the second interval, go, going all the way through to the seventh interval to the letter B, the note B. The interval is the seventh interval, and then it starts off again with the same name letter. And that is actually vibrating at twice the vibrations per second. So, you know, if this is uh, 256 vibrations per second, then that C is vibrating exactly at twice that number. And that's a mathematical fact. Now, imagine having to listen to an orchestra with each section of that orchestra, like the clarinets and the trombones and the flutes and the tubas and the drummers and everyone. Um, interpreting the number of notes per scale separately, the number of beats per measure, and the pitch of each note. They aren't even in tune together, but they just do their own thing. They're okay with themselves, but when they put themselves together with the other, you know, you can think of them as different communities. If they're not all together, then it would be like madness. It'd sound like chaos, and it would be ugly. It would be disharmonious. And in music, we call that dissonance. And when we're not harmonious with the weak, if we're not all together on that, then we have dissonance and we're not in harmony with each other. Two cannot walk together unless they agree, you know? Now, uh, the lunar Sabbathers are starting to become very, very prominent. And they're picking out things using eisegesis. They're bringing something that they already think and believe to ter interpret scripture with, and they're not correct. Now let's look at Leviticus or Wyokra chapter 23, which we mentioned earlier, and it, it see how it's impossible to work out for a lunar Sabbather, since Yahuwah discusses seven complete weeks back to back. And then he mentions the morrow after the seventh Sabbath, and it makes 50 continuous days, <clears throat> okay? Now, if you have seven sevens, that's seven times seven down here, see? It equals 49, and the, and the morning, the, mor the morrow, the day after the seventh Sabbath is a 50th day. And so he even says that in the text. And from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the, the sheaf of the wave offering, you count for yourselves seven full weeks. That's Sheba, or Sheba, Shabbathoth, Tamimoth. Now that timimoth means perfect, real weeks, not just piecemeal seven days, the week. Now, until the morrow after the seventh Sabbath, you count 50 days, and you shall bring a new grain offering to Yahuwah. That was an order for the priesthood to do. Now there it is. It's seven complete perfect weeks, plus the day after makes 50 days. Now lunar Sabbathers, they will ar arrive at seven Sabbaths after 37 days. So they don't get to it because they, they keep changing their, their pattern because there's two <clears throat> new moons within that 50-day period. 
Now, here's some uh, other things that you've probably even noticed in the real world where you've seen calendars that are printed where the days of the week are shifted. And this is disturbing. Now, in Daniel 7, verse 23 to 25, it says, this is what he said, the fourth beast is the fourth rain on earth, which is different from all other rains, and it devours all the earth, tramples it down, and crushes it. And the ten horns are ten sovereigns from this rain. They shall rise, and another shall rise after them, and it is different from the first ones, and it humbles three sovereigns, and it speaks words against the Most High, and it wears out the set-apart ones of the Most High, and it intends to change appointed times, that's the festivals, Moedim, and law, the word Torah is in there, instructions, and they are given into his hand for a time and times and half a time. And these pictures illustrate some of the things that have done, uh, been done. They start off their week with what they call the day of the moon, and then they move through the week, and the seventh day of the moon of the of the week is Sunday in this pattern. And here too. So you see that? And that's the way a lot of people accept it in their minds. And they actually form these ideas. Now time measurement began in Genesis chapter one. It's described in verse 24 and Elohim said let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years the lights were not for weeks that's not what the lights were put there for it's for days and seasons and years now the week can only be revealed by Yahuwah and that's if, if not for Yahuwah we would not know when the what the week was we wouldn't even know there were seven days we would not even know what day of the week it was but he revealed it and he then he had to re-reveal it to the, the the children of israel when they came out of the land of, of mitzrayim apparently the adversary the dragon had been diligently destroying that now at the close uh now jubilees is a book i don't know if, if, if any of you have ever heard of the book of jubilees but the book of Jubilees in the fourth chapter says, and at the close of the 19th Jubilee, in the seventh week, in the sixth year, and that's actually Anno Mundi is what AM stands for, the 930th year, thereof Adam died. He was 930 years old. And all his sons buried him in the land of his creation, and he was the first to be buried in the earth. And he lacked 70 years of 1,000 years. Thus, we have the number 930. That's 70 years shy of 1,000 years. Now that's a day. Remember, one day is 1,000 years. Now, and for 1,000 years are as one day in the testimony of the heavens, and therefore was it written concerning the tree of knowledge. On the day that you eat thereof, you shall die. On the day that you eat thereof, you shall die. So he didn't die the literal day, but he died in that thousand year day. For this reason, he did not complete the years of his day, for he died during it. You see, um, there's 20 jubilees in a thousand years, which is one day. 20, a jubilee is 50 years. And in the 50th year, it's a year of release. In other words, if property was taken from your family or sold or borrowed, then it would be returned to you after 50 years. So there was a rebooting of all the ownership. Now, uh, that's been abandoned by humanity. If we did that, then uh, we wouldn't have any natural de uh, national debt because it would be forgiven, you know. Um, property would be res restored. And uh, in, the, in the total one, in the total span of 7,000 years, there's seven times 20 or 140 jubilees. Now, I don't want you to have to remember all that. I'll repeat this. But uh, the early believers had insights in the very beginning. The early believers, the Nazarim, they had insights. Now, the later Nicolaitans labeled those who preceded the circus fathers, the anti-Nicene fathers, people that lived before the Council of Nicaea. 
The epistle of Barnabas was written somewhere around 200 years after Yahushua's birth. And it actually expounded on the concept of the 7,000 year plan of Yahuwah, stating that the ending of the, of the 6,000 years would occur 6,000 years from the creation of mankind. Now, that, that's a problem because we don't know that it's actually the, starting from that beginning or the fall. When, when Adam and Kua, the first man and woman, fell, that might have been the beginning point. Or it might have been a little later than that. We don't really know what the beginning point is, so we're not going to fix any return dates. But we know that it's somewhere in the very beginning that it started. And anyway, this is what one of the early believers wrote. Of the Sabbath, he speaks in the beginning of the creation, and Elohim made the works of his hands in six days, and he ended on the seventh day and rested on it, and he blessed it. Give heed, children, what this means. He ended in six days. And, he, and this is what he means, that in 6,000 years, Yahuwah shall bring all things to an end, for the day with him signifies a thousand years. And this he himself bears witness, saying, Behold, the day of Yahuwah shall be as a thousand years. Therefore, children, in six days, that is, in 6,000 years, everything shall come to an end. And he rested on the seventh day. This is what he means. When his son shall come and shall abolish the time of the lawless one, we're going to mention the lawless one a little later too. And shall judge the impious and shall change the sun and the moon and the stars. Then he truly rests on the seventh day. So uh, at the end of 6,000 years, beginning at some point, there's going to be a, a seventh day that's going to start. That's what it's called. Now that was recorded by, in the Apostolic Fathers, the Epistle of Barnabas. Uh, I'm using the word circus here because it's, uh, it's really derived from the same source, but uh, the fathers, you know, of the catechetical school of Alexandria, they also had some knowledge, don't doubt that, although they were opposed to the original followers, the Nazarene, because we observe the Sabbath. They wanted to promote Sunday. Now, Irenaeus and Tertullian were contemporaries of Origen. Irenaeus, in his battle against raging heresies, which were inundating the believers of his day, he wrote this book called Against Heresies. Now, here's what he says in Book 1, Chapter 28, Chapter 3. For in as many days as the world was made, in, in, uh, did you catch that? For in as many days as this world w was made, in so many thousand years shall it be concluded. And for this reason, the scripture says, thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all their adornment and Elohim brought to a conclusion upon the sixth day, the works that he had made. And Elohim rested upon the seventh day from all his works. This is an account of the things formerly created for also it is a prophecy of what is to come. For the day of Yahuwah is as a thousand years and in six days created things were completed. It is evident, therefore, that they will come to an end at the 6,000th year. Or it says here, yeah, yeah, at the 6,000th year. So these, uh, and down at the bottom, we've got the names of some of these uh, fathers' names. One of them was named Lucifer, by the way. That's interesting. If you look that up, you can find one of the names of the fathers was uh, Lucifer. Now, the Jewish encyclopedia is very, even more detailed. They, they, they mention this, quote, the Perso-Babylonian world year of 12 millennia, now that's saying that the, uh, the year in the Babylonian idea was 12 millennia, that's 12,000 years. That was their world year, but that was just their, their numeric processing of it. Um, however, was transformed in Jewish eschatology into a world week of seven millennia corresponding with the week of creation. It corresponds with the week of creation, but it's you know, expanded to a thousand years per day. Now the verse, a thousand years in your sight are but as yesterday, that's Psalm 90 verse four, having suggested the idea that the present world of toil is to be followed by a sabbatical millennium, a thousand year millennium of rest. 
Okay, the world to come is what they call it. The six millennia were again divided into three periods. Now look at this one. This is kind of interesting. Of course, we don't have beginning points and end points, but the first 2,000 years were devoid of the law, devoid of the Torah, maybe some of the Torah, you know, but I think there were still, because obviously Abraham had to have known Yahuwah's will. The next 2,000 years are under the rule of the Torah, and the, and the last 2,000 years, which we're in right now, preparing amid struggles and through catastrophes for the rule of the Messiah. And the rule of the Messiah is pointing to the, millenn the seventh millennia instead of the rule of the dragon. Because see, the rule of the dragon is going on right now and has been since the very beginning, since the fall. Because the, the dragon deceived mankind and has been in charge of the world. Now, eschatology is, the, this is under the topic eschatology in the Jewish Encyclopedia. Now note this, Abraham was born approximately 2004 before Yehusha. And Yehusha was born around 4 BC, so that was about 2,000 years apart. So, you know, Abraham was born 2,000 years before, and, you know, that's kind of interesting. But the birthdays are actually a distraction because it, the covenants, and those are the things that are, really matter. When a guy's born is not that important. We think it is. But what about when Yehusha resurrected? That has even more importance than when he was actually born in some, in some ways. But, of course, when he was born is very important because it's pointing out uh, the, the tabernacles in Sukkoth, you know. But, uh, I mean, it, it's all important with Yehusha. But our births are not so important. So the last 2,000 years began at Yehusha's death and resurrection which was roughly 27 CE, or Common Era, or AD. And that might indicate that Yehusha may return 2,000 years from the time of his resurrection, not his birth. So maybe we've been a little off on that. But there is something that points to Sukkoth that is returned too, because we expect him to return at Sukkoth. He was born at a Sukkoth, but perhaps those years that his, he lived on the earth performing the mission of his father there was another beginning point place there, you know. But look at this. There's a fellow that was a, an Irish uh, bishop who was very Catholic, but he wrote a, he did a study of each lifetime of each person in the scriptures. James Usher was an archbishop. And in the 17th century, he placed creation according to Genesis at 4004 BCE, exactly 4,000 years before Yahushua's approximate birth date. Now, what event is Yehusha using, <laughs> Yehuda using? I don't know. What event, what starting point is he using? We don't know. But that is the mystery. That the Jewish calendar start date is around 235 years short of the time allotted for each lifespan carefully added up by James Usher. And some have suggested that the, Jew, the Jewish calendar begins with the birth of Enosh, the grandson of Adam because Enosh was born 235 years after the creation of Adam. And here's his book here, The Annals of the World is the name of his book. And uh, he's very, uh, very detailed. I mean, he goes into great detail. The book is, it, is like two inches thick. Now in Proverbs 9, it says, wisdom has built her house. She has hewn out its seven columns. And what would those columns be but perhaps the weak? Revelation 2 says, To the messenger of the assembly of Ephesus write, He who is holding the seven stars in his right hand, who is walking in the midst of the seven golden lampstands, says this, I know your works and your labor and your endurance, and that you are not able to bear evil ones, and have tried those who say they are emissaries, that means tested them, who say they are emissaries and are not, and have found them false. And you have been bearing up and having endur endurance and have labored for my name's sake and not have become weary. Now today, lunar Sabbathers are walking among us. They're changing the days of the week. And that's a very, very first time this has ever happened. No one has ever done this. There's no record of that. Uh, just uh, back when uh, Chris Coster was writing the scriptures, Chris Coster would 
would have said, what? Lunar Sabbath? What, what is that? And there's no record in any of history about anything like this. Now, continuing in Revelation, but I hold this against you, that you have left your first love. So remember from where you have fallen and repent and do the first works, or else I shall come to you speedily and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. This, yet this you have, that you hate the work of the Nicolaites, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the assemblies. To him who overcomes, I shall give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the, gar of the paradise of Elohim. Now the seven branch menorah is an emblem or a sign of something. It's se several somethings, but it has to involve the seven day week also. And it points to the heartbeat of creation and to the creator and to the light of Torah, which he says will give us life if we will walk in, in the light of the Torah. Now, the Torah is Yehusha. Yehusha is the one we call the Messiah. He is the light, the way, and the truth, you know. So the, the walking Torah. So we all become little walking Torahs when he inhabits us. Now, Colossians 2 says, Let no one therefore judge you in eating or in drinking or in respect of a festival or a, a new moon or Sabbaths, which are a shadow of what is to come for the body of the Messiah. Now, the, this can be interpreted with a dark eye or an eye of light. You can look at that and say, don't let anybody judge you in eating or drinking. <laughs> well, it's not, uh, you know, outside of Torah, if they judge you... Uh, then they're in error. But if they judge you or they make determinations about what you're doing with Torah, then you've got to pay attention. You know, the new moons are real, you know, but there's one of those new moons we have to rest on, but the rest we don't. Now, uh, time is stable. It's not changing. It's a continuously repeating thing. If Israel ever lost track of it again, then Yahuwah would surely restore it to us just as he did during the first exodus. Now, it hasn't been lost. Since Yahushua walked this earth, no, there has been not one day lost. In fact, there was a time when, in 1582, I believe it was, that the, the, the days of the Roman calendar moved, but the week didn't change. Yahushua observed every weekly Sabbath, as well as the annual appointed times, and there's been no break in the pattern of the week since he walked the earth. Now it's written in Exodus 20, for in six days Yahuwah made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore Yahuwah blessed the Sabbath day and set it apart. So he blessed the day. The seventh day Sabbath is the only day blessed by Yahuwah. Now Rome commanded that we are to rather honor the Romans day of the sun in its place and work on the Sabbath. Now we're going to read, you know, in the Edict of Constantine, well, that, that's something you can look up, but this is uh, interesting. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, it says, As to the coming of our master, Yahushua HaMashiach, and our gathering together with him, we ask you, brothers, not to become easily unsettled in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as if the day of Yahuwah has come. Let no one deceive you in any way, because the falling away is to come first. And the man of lawlessness is to be revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called Elohim, or that is worship, so that he sits as Elohim in the dwelling place of Elohim, showing himself that he is Elohim. Now that word, lawlessness, is the from the Greek, it's hamartia, and some texts are translating that word as sin. But this man might be possessed by the same one that we read of in the prophecy in Isaiah 14, chapter, uh, verse 12. And that word is Hillel, and it means the shining one. And it's the sovereign of Babel, the dragon. So the man of lawlessness is going to be probably inhabited by this creature. And then continuing, do you not remember what I told you, that I told you this while I was still with you? And now you know what restrains for him to be revealed in his time. Now the restrainer, a lot of people are taught by Christianity that the restrainer is the Ruach HaKodesh, 
the spirit of Messiah. But actually, the restrainer is actually the dragon himself. He's the one doing the restraining, and you'll see that in the, in the rest of this text. For the secret of lawlessness is already at work, only until he who now restrains comes out of the midst. Restrains truth. That's what he's restraining. And then the lawless one shall be revealed, whom the master shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and bring to naught with the manifestation of his coming. So you see the master, Yahusha, is the one that's coming. He's not going to be taken out of the midst. He's the one that's coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of, of Satan with all power and signs and wonders of falsehood and with all deceit of unrighteousness in those perishing because they did not receive the love of the truth in order for them to be saved. And for this reason, Elohim sends them a working of delusion for them to believe the falsehood in order that all should be judged who did not believe the truth but have delighted in the unrighteousness. Now, before the great flood, there were rebellious Malachim, and they produced these beings that we read about called Nephilim. And Nephilim means fallen ones. And in Genesis chapter 6, it says, And it came to be when men began to increase on the face of the earth, and daughters were born to them, that the sons of Elohim saw the daughters of men. Now, the sons of Elohim are these spiritual beings, the fallen ones that they were good, and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. And Yahuwah said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever in his going astray. He is flesh, and his days shall be 120 years. Now the Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of Elohim came into the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old, the men of name. And here's a picture of, of a current contemporary giant. You know, this, this is a fellow that, uh, this picture can't be that, that old. And there's an ancient giant depicted right here. It's enthroned here. This is the size of the regular men, and there's the giant. And, of course, we see the, the emblem of the uh, image of the beast right there in the middle. Now, lifespans were at one time very, very long, and they wouldn't have ever had a, a span at all. They would have been eternal if, if they had never fallen, because Adam and Kawa were created to have never had to die if they hadn't uh, transgressed Yahuwah's laws. But the, the thing of it is, life, lifespans were shortened, and after this declaration of Yahuwah, no one lived longer than 120 years. Now, Yobel is 50 years, so 140 times 50 equals 7,000 years. Now, a day is as 1,000 years, six days 1,000 years times 6 is 6,000. Makes the case that mortal man's days will be 120 jubilees. In other words, the reign of mankind will be 120 jubilees. And that is interesting because that works out to be 100, uh, exactly 6,000 years. Or, yeah, 120 jubilees times, or 120 times 50 is 6,000 years. So the struggle, the millennium of rest, that is going to arrive will complete the whole struggle of the war in heaven. So the war in heaven is still raging, and that's what we tend to forget. We, we, we hear about a war in heaven, but then we think, well, that ended, and then now we're dealing with something else. The war in heaven is still going on. The struggle between Hashatan and his fallen messengers, Malachim, and their final outcome is, is still ahead. They're going to get arrested. A lot of them are actually still under arrest, but there's a lot of them that are not under arrest. The really vicious ones are still in prison, but they're going to be released. Now, 2 Peter 3 says, And the present heavens and the earth are treasured up by the same word, being kept for fire, to a day of judgment and destruction of wicked men. But, beloved ones, let not this one matter be hidden from you, that with Yahuwah one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. Yahuwah is not slow in regard to the promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards us, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of Yahuwah shall come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with intense heat, and the earth and the works that are in it shall be burned up. And Daniel 9 models the jubilee pattern when he discusses the word weeks. But what are jubilees 
again, that, well, Leviticus 25, ver verse 8 through 10 explain this. And you shall count seven Sabbaths of years for yourself. Seven times seven years. And the time of the seven Sabbaths of years shall be to you 49 years. You shall then sound a ram's horn to pass through on the 10th day of the seventh month on the day of atonement because cause a ram's horn to pass through your, all your land. In other words, you're supposed to hear on the day of atonement that on that 49th year in the seventh month on the 10th day. And you shall set the 50th year apart. That ram's horn starts at the beginning of that, of the, at that point and proclaim release throughout all the land to all its inhabitants. It is a jubilee for you. So the, that begins that whole year of, of a jubilee. And each of you shall return to his possession, in other words, what was his family's, and each of you return to his clan. In other words, if you're a slave, you're released. This inscription is on this bell that's in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And it says this, proclaim, and I, I won't pronounce this word, it's L-I-B-E-R-T-Y, that's a Roman deity's name, throughout all the land unto the inhabitants thereof, and then they quote Leviticus 23, verse 25, verse 10. By order of the assembly of the province of Pennsylvania for the state house in Philadelphia, Pass and Stowe, Philadelphia, and then the year 1753 in Roman numerals. Now the word, L-I-B-E-R-T-Y, okay, that's the name of a pagan deity, a Roman one. And in the, in the Hebrew, up here in, Levit in Leviticus, it's not the word that, that the quote here uses, it's the word release. And the word release is the Hebrew word deror, and it means a sudden release, like a very fast burst, a release. Now the Sabbath is a sign forever. Exodus 31 says this, and you speak to the children of Israel saying, my Sabbath you are to guard by all means, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations to know that I, Yahuwah, am setting you apart and you shall guard the Sabbath. That's the Hebrew word shamar, you see down here. And for it is set apart to you. Everyone who profanes it shall certainly be put to death. For everyone who works on it, that being shall be cut off from among his people. Six days work is done. And, the, and on the seventh is a Sabbath of rest set apart to Yahuwah. Everyone doing work on the Sabbath day shall certainly be put to death. And the children of Israel shall guard the Sabbath and observe the Sabbath throughout their generations as an everlasting covenant. Between me and the children of Israel, it is a sign forever. For in six days, Yahuwah made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day, he rested and was refreshed. Now that's repeated in Ezekiel or Yehezkel 20. Now a certain festival will one day usher in the wedding feast under a kupa or a tent. Now I'm going to show you some pictures of a, a kupa. A kupa is a covering. It's a household, you know. In Zechariah chapter 14, it says this. Now this is during the millennial rest. This is future during the 7,000 years, okay? Zechariah 14, starting at verse 16, and it shall be that all who are left from the Gentiles, which came up against Jerusalem, shall go up year to year to bow themselves to the sovereign, Yahuwah of hosts, and to observe the festival of booths. That's the word Sukkoth. And it shall be that if any one of the clans of the earth does not come up to Jerusalem to bow himself to the sovereign Yahuwah of hosts, on them there is to be no rain. And if the clan of Mitzrayim does not come up and enter in, then there is no rain. On them is the plague which Yahuwah plagues the Gentiles who do not come up to observe the festival of booths. That's the festival of tents or tabernacles, sometimes people use. Uh, the word is Sukkoth. This is the punishment of Mitzrayim and the punishment of all the Gentiles that do not come up to observe the festival of booths. Now that festival of booths is pointing to something very important. It is the wedding supper event. It's when the wedding supper happens, but it's gonna be going on year by year by year by year, kind of like a wedding anniversary, you know. Even though the, the wedding anniversary that we're celebrating now is Shavuot, the giving of the Torah, 
and when it was written on our hearts, the anniversary of that marriage at Sinai is our wedding anniversary, but the actual taking the bride into the chamber or the kupa, the house, is very, very important. In, uh, in Yahukanen or John chapter 14, Yahusha said this, in my father's house, now think about these words, in my father's house, there are many staying places, there are many rooms or booths, and if, I, if, and if not, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, that, that place is, of course, a, a room, I shall come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, you might be too. Now, the bride is going to get married under this kupa, and they're going to be joined together. Now, um, Sukkoth, or tenth, is a shadow of things to come. Yahushua was born during this time of Sukkoth, and the assembly will also be born. In other words, you're, when you're really born, see, you've been begotten from above. You've received something. But when you're transformed, you will ascend. You will be an ascended being. Your body is going to be changed in the twinkling of an eye, and you will have ascended to a different plane of existence. And you will be clothed in immor Im immortality. Now, at that point, you're going to accept your inheritance, and your inheritance is actually your husband. Yahusha is your inheritance. And that's your bridegroom. It's Yisrael's bridegroom. If you're not joined to Yisrael, you can't usurp Yisrael's status. You have to become Yisrael and enter the covenant. If you're outside the covenant, you're not Israel. Yisrael. So Psalm 25 is, a, is an interesting thing to think about in that context. Who then is the man that fears Yahuwah? He teaches him in the way he should choose. His life dwells in good, and his seed inherits the earth inherits the earth. We're not going anywhere into the skies. We will to meet him, and then we'll be returning. The secret of Yahuwah is with those who fear him, and he makes his covenant known to them. Now, that's very important, because if you won't receive his covenant and obey his covenant, he will not allow you to have his name. You're not his bride. You know, the bride takes the name of her husband, and esteems that name, you know, thinks highly of it. The bride has to show up at her wedding and needs to have been rehearsing for it. Now, it's also a, a marriage is what it is. The covenant is actually a marriage, the Ten Commandments. It's your covenant, it's your covenant with him. He, get, he gave no other covenant, you know. He sealed it in his own blood to cover you, uh, to sprinkle your hearts. Luke 13, Yahushua is saying these words. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, killing the prophets and stoning those who are sent to her. How often I wish to gather your children together the way a hen gathers her chickens under her wings, but you would not. See, your house is left to you laid waste. And truly I say to you, you shall by no means see me until the time comes when you say, Blessed is he who is coming in the name of Yahuwah, not in the name of anyone else, you, you have to say, blessed is the one who is coming in the name of Yahuwah, not G-O-D or L-O-R-D or J-E-S-U-S. -S. It's the name of Yahuwah. And Yahuwah, is, his name is in the name of the Messiah. Yahush, Yahusha means Yah is our deliverer. <clears throat> and there's the way it looked in many of the ancient scrolls. And you'll notice that each one has a name, and it starts on the right, and it moves to the left, see? Our, our language goes the other way. You have a yod equivalent to our y, a he, an ua, and a he. And of course, over time, these things took different shapes in that middle one. But this shape is actually a Latin shape for the Greek upsilon. Because see, it's the same shape. You take that away, and they take the stem away, and you've got a v. But uh, that's the way they wrote it, you know? But the Hebrew letter that's shaped this way produced the Greek letter in the same shape. Upsilon. See, the sixth letter of the Hebrew alphabet is the same letter in the Greek, shape and sound, called Upsilon. It's a U. It's not a double U. It's a U. And we started out the seminar explaining that, and I hope this helps 
sort of picture it. Now, our commission, our co-mission with Yehusha was given to us, and it involves his name and his Torah. We guard that. That's what Natsuri means, watchmen, guardians. And it's the order that we were given to teach righteousness to, to the nations. In Matthew, Yahushua said, therefore, go and make taught ones of all the nations, immersing them in the name, the name, of the Father and of the Son and of the set-apart spirit, because they all have the same name, because they're the same being. Teaching them, that's the Gentiles, to guard all that I have commanded you. And see, I am with you always until the end of the age. And the end of the age is very, very, very close. Uh, it could happen at any time. You know, Israel, the, the, the state of Israel, is in serious trouble right now. At any moment, the Arab nations could bomb them with nuclear weapons because, you know, uh, Iran is probably fighting the proxy wars all over anyway. They're probably behind all of the toppling of these uh, governments that we're seeing going on. But at any moment, this thing could change. So we're told to teach the name and teach them the Torah of Yahuwah. It's that simple. It's not complicated. It's very simple. So when our hearts beat in time with Yahuwah's, hearts, or Yahuwah's heart, then we love what he loves. And that would have to include all those that he is redeeming. So we, we have to get together as Nazarene and start loving one another because we're seeing so much anger and hatred and we're arguing over knowledge. You know, arguing about what one person thinks and another person. We're, we're taking our eyes off of Yahushua. Remember when, when Peter or Kepha was stepping out of the boat to go to, to walk on the water because he, he bid Yahushua to at, allow him to? And he started out just fine, and then he saw, he looked away from Yahushua and saw the wind and the waves, and then he started to sink. If we take our eyes off of Yahushua, and we start looking at our other problems and ourselves, then that's when we're going to lose it. We're going to start sinking, and we're not going to have him. We need to, he's got us, though, but we just need to reestablish our, our eye contact with him, you know. And you do that through prayer and meditation in his Torah, you know. Baruch haba b'shem Yahuwah. Blessed is the one who is coming in the name of Yahuwah. And he said he wouldn't, we wouldn't see him again until we started saying that. We're starting to say it. That's an indication. 